Hey, Harp Slingers, welcome to the Harp Slinger podcast, where each and every week we hang out with the greatest harmonica players in the music business. Hey, as I say every week, I'm sure you're tired of hearing this, but if you're watching this on the Honer Music Facebook page, go down there, push your share button, share it to your personal profile, help us spread the word, yeah? And if you haven't checked out the uh, the Harp Slinger YouTube channel page, you've got to go do that right now. There's a great list of just the best harmonica players. And as I always say, if you haven't seen your favorite harp players up there yet, Make sure you send me a note. You can do that right there uh, in the comment section of my YouTube uh, videos. And let me know who you'd like to see. I've gotten a number of, uh, of messages from, from folks, and I'm doing my best to get those people on the list. So, without further ado, everybody, I hope, uh, I hope you're as excited as I am. This is going to be a big one today. My next guest is an amazing harmonica player and looping artist from Memphis, Tennessee. In 2008, he bested several hundred contestants to make the finals of the Orpheum Star Search competition in Memphis, culminating with a jaw-dropping performance of Magic Dick's Whammer Jammer. He's been featured in Living Blues Magazine on NPR's Weekend Edition and topped both the U.S. iTunes and Amazon Blues charts, and he's also a pediatric neurologist. I may be out of my depth here, folks. Here he is, Brandon Bailey. Welcome, Brandon. How you feeling, man? Hey, how's it going? Great pleasure to have to you. Here. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for for being on the Harp Slinger podcast. Absolutely. Yeah, man. So uh, I, I've, I've been, been watching a long time now. Your first guest was my mentor, Adam. So <laughs> absolutely, I had to be here. Yeah, right on. You know, I'm, I love Adam Gusso for many reasons. Uh, you know, I, of course, he's a great harmonica player, but just what a brain! I love listening to uh, the way he tells. Uh, his stories and the way he uh, interjects all of this great blues history, which he had, he, he, you know, he's a, he's a doctor uh, as you are only, only an educational doctor, you know, well, you know, Adam is a real intellect, uh, yes, frankly. Yeah. And that's always been what really attracted me to his approach to both teaching and playing the harmonica. It's mm -hmm. fascinating seeing his evolution over the years on YouTube and now on right. social media uh -huh. uh, that intellect still shines through for very very brightly absolutely i, I got to admit i was for that was uh to have him as my first guest on the podcast was a little daunting i i uh you know i was well aware of who he was i'd been checking out his videos for a long time but i was researching just to make sure and i read uh, a couple of his books uh you know just to make sure that i was I knew what I was talking about, and uh, and he was just so great and gracious. He's just a wonderful guy. Anyway, let's talk about you, my friend. You're from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, born and raised there. And uh, so, uh, tell me, uh, when did I mean you grew up in in Blues Central? I mean that is that's the home of the blues, that whole area. When did you discover uh, harmonica? When did you discover the blues? When did you figure out that this is what you wanted to do? Well, it's fascinating, really. I actually uh, was born and partially raised first two years of my life in St. Louis. Oh, okay. And I actually come from a very musical family. My dad played the bass. Uh, my mom plays the flute. Um, have a lot of family who are actually quite prominent musicians. Oh. So um, by the time I moved to Memphis, I was about three years old. And... Honestly, I did not grow up listening to very much blues music. Uh -huh. I grew up listening to mostly uh, gospel, uh -huh. primarily, um, in particular, Southern gospel. Uh -huh. um, a lot of classic R&B, circa the 1950s through 70s. Right on. Um, quite a bit of soul music, uh, because the early 90s was permeated with a lot of really good R&B and neo-soul. Uh -huh. Yes. So most of my grounding was in those areas. And of course, pop. I was a huge Michael Jackson fan growing up. <laughs> Me too. And yeah. that was between Michael and Janet. Um, that took most of my musical interest for years. I love it. So by the time I even found the harmonica, I think I was looking for something that really spoke to me personally, to my uh -huh. spirit. Uh because I was a teenager when I first picked up the instrument, and right. I really just really enjoyed how the sound just kind of permeated my mm -hmm. being. Mm -hmm. So I sought to be able to, to recreate that sound. And uh, Memphis, I learned, was one of the places where many of the greatest living and past harmonicists 
have at least visited or passed through or left their mark in some way. Mm -hmm. So it became this honor for me to be able to learn and grow and play in this city with so much rich and beautiful mm -hmm. musical heritage. Absolutely. And you know, St. Louis actually has, I mean, you come from a, oh, an yeah. that's another wonderfully musical city. We were Absolutely. almost, uh, we're almost neighbors. I mean, I grew up on the Mississippi river, South of St. Louis, about an hour. Uh, yeah. 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 So yeah, I, I, yeah. So I'm from a very small town, but you know, if you wanted to do something cultural, you went to St. Louis, you know? Yes. And uh, yeah. yeah, I remember even when I was a child, there was some great blues going on in, in Chicago still then. I mean, in, in uh, St. Louis then still. But, uh, Absolutely. So who, who are some of your, your favorites? Who were some of the guys that inspired you the most when you were? Oh, when that's you were a great question. Um, starting out, um, obviously a lot of Memphian. Uh -huh. So I started listening to Charlie Muscle White, for instance. Right. Um, I started listening to <laughs> Billy Gibson. Okay. Yeah. A master harmonica player, uh, the Prince of Bill Street. Mm -hmm. um, I began listening to Blind Mississippi Morris. Um, a lot of local individuals. Okay. Initially. Yeah. Um, through Adam and his YouTube series, I started to learn a lot more about different harmonica players like Sonny Boy Williamson II, right. Sonny Boy Williamson I, um, and all the Chicago blues musicians, the Little Walters, Big Walters, James Cotton, yes, right. so on and so forth. So uh, it what began is actually a very limited uh scope, if you will, of the harmonica gradually grew into an almost encyclopedic knowledge of, okay, this is what uh, this instrument means from a great deal of perspectives. Mm -hmm. So um, by the time that I was 14 or 15, uh, I started listening to much more modern harmonica players, if you will, mm -hmm. um, the Adam Gussos, the right. Jason Richies, sure. the uh, rest in peace Chris, <laughs> rest in peace Chris McCulloch. That, that was one of my biggest teachers. Actually, a lot of people yeah. don't realize that he taught me a great deal on the instrument, and uh, so I began to have sort of a different perspective of listening mm -hmm. to the harmonica. But certainly, my biggest names from uh, my Introductory period, certainly. I would say Sonny Boy Number Two, mm -hmm. um, certainly Charlie Muscle White, mm -hmm. um, heavily into Jason Ritchie, yeah, heavily into Big Walter specifically. Okay, um, and I'd stop it about right there as far as my intense study. Right, uh, what I just love to listen to. Yeah, yeah, I have a lot of the same uh, on my list. And a, a small side note, I will say this. Um, around the time when I was 15, I really started getting into blues traveler, uh -huh. um, because I was playing harmonica around Memphis and people kept bringing up this name. Hey, have you heard of this band called blues traveler? And I had not <laughs> at that point. Oh, right. <laughs> and I assumed it was a blues band or something like this. I had no idea it was a blues rock band, uh -huh. but when I heard John Popper for the first time, I was floored. Yeah. I could not believe the staccato 32nd, 64th notes just played <laughs> at gun speed, right? right? And yes, I have to uh, give a nod to Blues Traveler, uh, the album four in particular. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, re I, I, re I have similar, uh, first of all, your dossier there is like, uh, you know, all of those people are, some of my favorites as well, but uh, Blues Traveler, when I was in college, my friends were saying, hey, can you play, uh, you know, Run Around? And I'm like, I could, get, <laughs> I could get the first three bars out of it, you know, until he goes nuts, you know, and, uh, you know, you know, and that's if we're lucky. Yeah. That's if we're lucky. I'm I know. Day. I really should get the, the amazing slow downer and really uh, spend some You time. know, I never actually used that. That was the biggest thing in like 07, 08. <laughs> um, I always just used Audacity. 
Okay, and that works for you. You know, and uh, but my thing was I want to be able to hear it at speed. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, uh, in neuroscience, there's this thing about neuroplasticity and okay. how your brain learns something right. is oftentimes how we are going to interpret it continuing from the inception of that memory being programmed. So wow. if I'm learning how to play something at full speed, eventually, as you're listening, that full speed starts to slow down in your brain a little. Mm -hmm. starts to sound a little bit slower, a little bit um, more like you can pick uh, apart the individual pieces. So I love that. That's always been really my kind of rule to never slow down anything. Okay. All right. That's a, that's a major tip here. You just dropped. I'm going to get a lot of opposition that's... on that. I know. <laughs> I know it's hard guys, but the harmonica is difficult. That's why we play it. That's right. That's right. Hey, I know you also like, and you started with a lot of a, uh, Train train beats and stuff like that. Did you ever uh, get hip to uh, DeFord Bailey? I'm sure you did, right? I love absolutely. I actually know DeFord's grandson oh, wow. in Nashville. Okay. Um, he's actually a country musician himself. Um, the DeFord Bailey family is very, 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 very deeply musical. He is the founding member of the Grand Old Opry. That's right, and when you realize the sophistication of his playing almost a century ago, mm -hmm. it's astounding. Double stops, um, the ability to bend through a fox chaselet. See, now I have to get out of harmonica. Of yeah, yes, man. Um, let's see if I can find something low enough here. Let's do an A flat. Okay. So all of these rhythmic, uh, hand accentuated Stuff like that. It's fun. Yes, I love, I love the D Ford Bailey. Yeah, me too. I'm a big fan. I think he's fantastic. Well, you know, and, and what you were doing there sort of uh, is a great sort of uh, uh, sort of jumping off point for my next thing that I wanted to talk about, because DeFord, uh, you know, very possibly could be the first harp boxer. Let's you talk about that. Yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> let's have you talk about that, because this is your specialty. You, you t tell me, uh, tell me mm. what your thoughts on that. Well, I think that he was certainly probably one of the very first people to employ a largely rhythmic based harmonica style that also incorporated a melodic interplay uh -huh. um, for his time. However, I should also be noted that the origins and history of the harmonica are very mysterious. Uh, much of what we hear recorded as harmonica players from the early 19, what, 20s usually, mm -hmm. um, is a certain derivation of what was already being played and what was already being passed down and did not have the opportunity to be recorded, right? Right. Um, classic example, um, the blues musician Lead Belly is often credited with writing several um, blues songs, for instance, Black Betty. Mm -hmm. uh, however, he is known to not necessarily be the individual who originally wrote the piece as the song existed long before he was even born, which was in 1848, I believe. Okay. So when it comes to uh, origins of heart boxing, um, I think that the harmonica is a very special instrument in that it has so many different angles from which you can approach it. It can be a rhythmic instrument. It can be a melody instrument. It can have an accordion-like effect in which you are doing kind of both at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can play chords. You can play octaves. Um, so... One of the things that I think that people figured out very early on as a primary strength of the instrument 
was that you're able to create these really choppy, almost drum-like rhythm sounds. The right? Yeah. During an era in which there were no electronic music mm -hmm. uh, instruments whatsoever, mm -hmm. right? Um, one would have needed a way to both keep time as well as have a sense of melody. Right. Melody um, at one point was much more important in music than it is right now from a certain perspective. Melody used to be the primary thing that we listened to in a musical composition. Now it's sort of a, an orchestra of sounds. We have drums, we have bass, we have woodwinds, we have strings uh, that create these beautiful palettes, right? Mm -hmm. There used to not be as many palettes in the same way. It used to be a bit more of direct sound, I believe. Uh, so based upon that logic, uh, I think that the idea of harp boxing is very old. I think that the idea of having an instrument that can keep a rhythm and not just a melody, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's not 400 pounds, right? Like your organs, your right. music, four Ks. Yeah. Uh, it would have been very convenient, absolutely. And I think that part of that convenience uh, is also proven in many of the early electronic blues recordings. Um, in particular, I'm talking about our guy, Little Walter here. Right, right. right. Um, one could easily say that, well, Little Walter was a Chicago musician, you know, he was playing electric blues. There was no relation to the shortened uh, fox chases and train imitations that people were doing in the southern districts. I would beg to differ. I would say that the basis of most of the music that was being played in Chicago directly came from the cotton fields, plantations, and so forth in the southern states. Mm -hmm. um, this immigration is obvious with muddy waters. Mm -hmm. So when we're having such an immigration, one of the things that happens is the transportation of knowledge as well. Things are taught and passed down, usually by word of mouth, and music is no different in that respect. And I certainly um, would have seen Little Walter having been influenced by a more uh, rhythmic, almost Sonny Terry style, mm -hmm. uh, which would have made his playing in a way more effective. When we're listening to songs like Juke, we're listening to songs like Roller Coaster, mm -hmm. we're hearing a certain rhythmic use of the harmonica that had not been done before um, from a single note perspective. We've heard a lot of rhythmic use from a chordal perspective using, you know. Things like that, but not really. <laughs> where he's actually specifically punctuating the downbeat with notes, mm -hmm. not just chords. Um, so I think that his intellectual understanding of how to employ his instrument was uh, an evolution from literally the... So I, I think that they're all quite connected uh -huh. Frankly, um, now we're thinking about progression in music. Mm -hmm. um, where are the next steps for the harmonica? What has it not done? There's a great deal that it hasn't done yet. And so that requires just an understanding of uh, where can you place the strengths to the highest effect of the music that you're trying to play. For me, that worked out with harp boxing. Um, and it, harp boxing is really not my baby, actually. Um, and I've said this several times, L.D. Miller, for those who know, 
Sure. L.D. Okay. Miller is. Yeah. L.D. Miller is the person that I credit with really inventing harp boxing. Wow. And it's amazing. I saw him do it at Spa back in, I think this was 2012. Um, and I believe he made a YouTube video or two back in the day. Uh -huh. And I was just like, wow, that's so cool. I want to do that. So yeah. I started messing around with some different grooves and rhythms. And um, of course, at this time, I was also really getting into Son of Dave okay. and the looping style. Mm -hmm. So I just started to combine the two into uh, sort of my own thing. Yeah. it's And you continued that sort of with your, like, I've heard you talk uh, in other interviews about your uh, boots and cats uh, boots approach. And cats. Yes. And I, I just loved that. And I was walking around the house, you know, boots and cats, boots, cats, boots. It, it's just so easy. And you're like, that is so right on. How come I never thought of that? That's amazing. The human body, uh, the echoic chamber that we create, uh, lends itself to so many sounds that we articulate on the regular basis. Most of what a beatboxer is doing is just a punctuation of sounds that we're already using. Mm -hmm. especially within the English language. So perfect example, boots and cats. And um, I think that it just creates a fun way of thinking about music. Uh -huh. You know, something as simple as almost this nursery rhyme, boots, cats, boots and cats and boots and cats. It's just, it, it feels fun to do, right? Yeah, so sure. if it's fun, we can get really good at it. <laughs> that's true well so all right so i you know i tried it a little bit uh uh and it takes some serious coordination uh what do you have any tips for uh folks that are really wanting to to give this a go like uh, other than just you know nose to the grindstone stuff i mean uh, well um is that tips for beatboxing or tips for harp boxing how to harp boxing particularly Ooh. yes um because that you know the marrying of the two is where it really becomes. I feel like I can do one and I can do the other, but doing them together. Well, the the suggestion is do whatever feels good. Okay. Because the idea behind harp boxing is to be able to create rhythms and grooves with a beat using mm -hmm. your mouth and an instrument that naturally lends itself to breathing. Mm -hmm. Right. So. For instance, um, the way that I breathe and the rhythm in which I have learned uh, to create these textures, right, may not be the same rhythm that you will feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. That may be a completely different breathing pattern. Okay. So it's okay to experiment outside of just breathing in and out and just doing the boots and cats examples that you've seen in my videos. Right, right. The idea is to create your own rhythm. Okay. Right? Everyone kind of walks at a different pace. Everyone has a different stride. The same is true in the way that we speak. Mm -hmm. Everyone speaks in different paces. There's a different rhythmic nature to language. Same thing with harmonica playing. And so what I don't want to do is now give you an example because then you're going to hear my rhythm right. and that's going to um, throw you off a little bit from uh -huh. your, your own. But let's see if we can create something. Okay. So um, let's try... <laughs>
fantastic, man. So let me ask a silly question about that. Do you ever? There are uh, no silly questions. I, I, all of this uh, expulsion, right, of this great burst of air in in um, you know, in rhythm. Do you ever have any issues of blowing, you know, like spittle or anything in in into your harp and causing any issues while you're doing the gig? That's I mean, a great question. Uh, generally, no. Um, part of what you're trying to do is very dry. Okay. Right. You're not wanting a whole lot of saliva like around mm-hmm. your lips while you're doing this, because yeah. obviously you're probably spitting on your audience, which in most <laughs> cultural circles usually isn't, you know, not a good thing. Taken very good. So, uh, no, it's um, most of what I'm trying to do as far as the uh, beatbox elements are dry. Mm-hmm. Right. I want to have as dry of a vocal cavity of the mouth structure as possible so that you know you're not ending up with those issues obviously that's not always easy <laughs> right. um we practice for dryness not for wetness just remember <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right actually yeah i've had students ask me you know i keep blowing spinning i'm like that just the more you do it the less you'll do that right? the more you play. do it the less you will do that and as far as most of the um uh, the uh, the peas right the mm-hmm. very difficult yeah to not create saliva with doing that uh, meat boxers are constantly creating saliva right yeah um that's about control as with anything with the harmonica um just like usually for someone who's a little bit more experienced with playing the instrument uh-huh. you're going to use a lot less breath uh-huh. than uh-huh. when you're first starting out right same thing with beatboxing same thing okay. with heart boxing the longer you're doing this uh the easier it will be to <laughs> not oversaturate your instrument <laughs> literally <It's a> <laughs> yeah uh so does your um, i notice your uh we all have an embouchure when we're playing our instrument but there's also a great embouchure that you have going right here when you're just beatboxing uh, okay and do that do you do those uh does that change at all when you when you put the harp to your mouth that uh, you know what i mean uh, honestly no Back and forth. um okay. when i'm um doing harp boxing it's usually the same embouchure for the most part the only yeah. difference and this is a key point removing the instrument from your lips in between actually beatboxing mm-hmm. so okay. when i'm doing this maybe if i do this from the side i'm slightly uh-huh taking the harmonic away from my mm-hmm. lip just ever so slightly about mm-hmm. a centimeter to allow um that air to enter into the chamber mm-hmm. right? um i've seen people try to do this with the harmonica stuck to their lips the entire time uh-huh. and i'm not really sure how you would do that yeah um uh, <laughs> Because your lips can't move, right, the right. instrument is right up against. So, in between, it's a, it's a. I mean, uh, the resonance that you get with the beatbox it, even is amazing. And I'm noticing it's sort of testament to how little you really need, how hard you don't need to blow into the harmonica. Yeah to get a sound out of it because even though you're two centimeters away i can f- i can hear just a little bit of that those reeds uh reacting even though you're away from the harp really yes. interesting really well, it's, it's about nuance right mm-hmm. um as the harmonica is an instrument of nuance the ability to bend a note the ability to do a warble the ability mm-hmm. to do a flutter the ability to do an overblow overdraw or overblow Mm -hmm. all about nuance and very specific fine tuning of the tongue's position in the mouth Mm -hmm. lip position your embouchure as well as the breath pressure Mm -hmm. and the longer you play the more you realize it's not in using force it's never about force it's about the least amount of force path of least resistance 
Yes, right on. Uh, you mentioned uh, overblows and overdraws. Are, are you uh, are you utilizing those much in your playing? Um, as the song permits, yes. Okay, right on. Good answer. Good answer, sir. <laughs> Hey, would you agree that uh, you're bringing this instrument to a whole new um, audience, or maybe a younger audience that might be uh, more open to, uh, you know, listening to and taking seriously the harmonica, uh, which they might not otherwise, you know, given the, the, the music that uh, maybe they feel like is old timey or, or whatever. Uh, would you agree that you're bringing this, I feel like you are, you're bringing this, I mean, you're expanding the reaches of that instrument and that's a, a wonderful thing. Well, I really appreciate you saying that and I hope that I am. Um, I think that every instrument has its evolution mm -hmm. and most instruments within the Western repertoire have had a certain evolution. Mm -hmm. Looking at woodwinds when we're looking at brass when we're looking at anything to do with the keyboard right. uh, anything to do with the drums anything to do with the bass like sky's the limit as far as what has been tried recorded implemented employed right mm -hmm. and then you look at certain classical instruments like ye old harmonica and you find <laughs> well this has been done and that has been done, but what about all these other things? Right. And you realize that sometimes um, attribution has a lot to do with uh, social impact uh, and social timing. Mm -hmm. And um, the attribution of the harmonica by younger and younger generations outside of personal interests, right? Um, usually kind of falls down to this fact in my belief that it hasn't been employed uh, very much mm -hmm. in what we consider modern 20th century Western music, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it has been employed, but the depth of those implications are not necessarily being felt right um so for me it's a lot about just a personal exploration um i'm the type of individual who loves knowing how things work and the origins of things mm -hmm. so for me the harmonica has so much unexplored territory that we are in an age of its origin still. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many people really realize that. You're looking at most instruments, their history has been founded hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. Bach, Beethoven, Brahms were using piano-like instruments years ago, okay? They achieved the highest of heights on their instruments back then <laughs> from a serious intellectual uh, written right uh, angle. And, uh, you know, a lot of what we do uh, is not really focused on the present. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, that's very a lot right. of what we play, though it has so much feeling and emotion and so much of us in it, is not necessarily intellectually focused on the present. So mm -hmm. that's sort of my angle, if that makes sense. Yes. Uh, and that's why um, it's really important to me to do what I can in that vein of, okay. What is modern music? What is modern 20th century Western music, as they called it in my collegiate classes? <laughs> right. And what does the harmonica sound like in that? Um, because outside of, frankly, Stevie Wonder, over the past, let's say, 40, 50 years, um, in, in, obviously, I'm talking about pop music mm -hmm. in that 
accent, right? Um, where do we really hear the harmonica regularly in chord? Right. And out of that implication, where are we hearing anything new? Right. Challenges of the modern day musician now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So back to your question, I really hope that I am at least bringing an attention to certain things, uh, musically speaking, because this is an instrument that we all take very, very seriously. And it would behoove us to do our due diligence in taking that instrument as seriously as possible. Yeah. And you clearly have. I mean, uh, I feel like uh, we hear this phrase a lot. I believe John F. Kennedy said it. Uh, you can't know where you're going until you know where you've been. And yeah. I think you yeah. sort of embody that. Uh, you you uh, can go throw down all of that, that stuff from the past that we as harp players love, that you said is so emotional, makes us feel good. There's so much of us in it. But you're, you know, I don't think you can... Uh, Maybe you can. I don't know. But I feel like you can take it to a new place when you have these building blocks and and you have those for sure. I mean, when I hear you play non beatbox things, it's equally as impressive. It's like, wow, I didn't know he did that too. I thought, you know, maybe this harp box thing was of course that's your thing, but you got all that other stuff. It's really, really, really Thank sick. you very much. Yeah. I man. mean, and that's the foundation. Um mm -hmm. I believe in learning a craft or an art, there is a certain uh, progression that has to be taken. Uh, something I learned from Jason. Yeah. Uh, imitate, assimilate, innovate. Yeah. First must imitate the past masters. Yeah. Then must assimilate that knowledge into a uh, grand uh, thesis, if you will, which is your ability to innovate, taking all of those things, all of the past, mixed with your own emotion, your own self, and to be able to create something new. So I love Jason so much. He's the, uh, the epitome of that. Yeah. Right? He's taken all of the stuff, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. And himself and his beautiful personality and created a musical style in and of itself on our instrument. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. Um, take me back to 2008. You're on uh, the stage in Memphis at the Orpheum Theater, and uh, you choose to do Whammer Jammer, one of, one of all of our personal favorites, right? <laughs> uh, that's a difficult song also, but you killed it, and I've, I've heard you do, you know, a very... Uh, performances of that uh, tell me tell me why you chose to do that song and uh, and, and I'm curious how long did it take you like I, I want to know how you get that 10 blow uh, shake thing Ooh, there is a very funny story to that entire <laughs> situation actually so um, the YouTube video that most people reference me playing that song is actually the year after I won okay I came back to perform the song Okay. Um, the year that I actually won, however, I was 15 years old. Um, had never played on stage before. <laughs> really? Really? Wow. That was my first time on wow. stage. Wow. And I learned the song from Adam's YouTube videos. He made, mm -hmm. I believe, a two-part series. Mm-hmm on whammer jammer and he put up this video of him playing it in his bathroom i remember because <laughs> the reverb was so good <laughs> so i being the homeschooled teenager that i was at the time with plenty of time on my hands by uh, mind you um reviewed the video countless times okay i'm going to learn this song that was i like that was my determination at that Learn the song, mostly, in about two weeks, mm -hmm. roughly two weeks. Um, recorded a video, sent it back, uh, and the comment section on Adam's video, this is a 14-year-old me at the time, <laughs> and this, now he did ask for this. I will preface it with, 
Adam, within the video, put in a request for people to list everything that he was doing wrong. Right. <laughs> well, 15, 14, I believe 14 year old me, I sent him like this long comment with point after point after point after <laughs> point after point of where he went off from the original recording. Uh -huh. Obviously, I'm at a different place in my own harmonic. <laughs> but I had a great deal of ego. And fortunately, it's something that he identified and uh, recognized as something positive. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it could have gone anyway. You sure. But um, after that, um, I believe it was actually a few months after uh, that exchange that I'd uh, gotten into this competition and realized, wait a minute, I don't know anything about performing. Uh -huh. I've never been on stage before. So I email Adam and say, hey, um, so I got into this talent competition and the reason why I'm even here is because of your YouTube videos. <laughs> Could you give me some advice or some pointers or some help on how to approach this? So very fortunate for me, Adam only lived about an hour away yeah. and was so nice as to come up and give me personalized coaching. Um, just on how to move around stage a little mm -hmm. better and how to approach this whole, okay, you have 5,000 people in front of you. Focus on this. Yeah. And um, obviously it worked out very well. Yeah. Um, but yes, that was actually a very nerve-wracking experience for me initially. Uh, having not had any stage experience, I was scared to death. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everybody else was a singer. Uh huh. So, uh, my perspective, I was just there. You know, I'm going to do the best I can, but I'm not going to win this thing. Like, seriously, they're going to give it to a harmonic? No. <laughs> but I was just so happy to be in the building and to have been selected amongst so many individuals. And Memphis is full of so much amazing talent. Um, it was a very, very big springboard for me. So, yeah. and it, and <laughs> it was a very fun time. It's a great, uh, it's great testament to also the power of this instrument in the hands of someone who can really play it, and the the effect that it uh, can can get from an audience. It's really spectacular. People it's just amazing. respond differently to the harmonica when it's. Played, you know oh, absolutely i have had people start crying after a show and you realize that these 10 holes have like an energy about them uh -huh. right it's a way that communicates with people that i don't know there's, there's something about it it's mm -hmm. akin to hearing an organ in a church yeah, or I know. Uh, being able to hear a beautiful cello mm -hmm. down, you know, a nice reverbed alley, you know, it's something very spiritual about it. Definitely. It's, it's amazing. It's a beautiful feeling. Um, I think that especially during these times, right, mm -hmm. people are hungry for uh, an authentic sound. Mm -hmm. Um more and more i keep hearing harmonica coming up in commercials yeah right television the uh black ranger on power rangers right now plays the harmonica oh really very well i might add actually it's actually Any idea who, that is? who is that who's playing that i haven't figured it out i'm trying to hopefully some people can help us out here because yeah. i have to know yeah, I think that's awesome. You know, I'm hearing it a lot too, and, and especially in commercials. And I'm and I'm always thinking, I wonder who that is. You know, who's playing that? It's hard to it's hard to to figure it out in like a f just a few bars, but you know, exactly, exactly. It's usually you know, there's uh, there's so many session players though yeah. who are so amazing uh -huh. and people who you never hear about. Sure, that's you know, so who yeah. knows? There's some mystery people. 
It is. That's right. Well, uh, you, so you know, you utilize the uh, the, the loop station or, or a, a loop a looper machine, a looper box, whatever. Uh, right. I'm not sure what you're using, but uh, you're looping, uh, yeah. and absolutely love it. So cool. Seems like a great way to uh, to write songs, actually. Um, to be Absolutely. able to layer things and, to, you know, in real time and work on them and hear what's coming out. Um, any other uh, effects that you like to employ in your show or, or are you a, no, a no effect guy? Well, tell me Ooh, about That's a really good question. Yeah, so I'm a little bit different. And a lot of my friends have these conversations with me about um, amps and uh, mm-hmm. microphones mm-hmm. and effects. Um, so something that a lot of people don't know about me is that I went to school for a little while, um, not only for psychology, um, but also for audio engineering after I finished my undergrad. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had the opportunity to learn a great deal about, um, the recording process and the science of recording. And so... When it comes to gear, um, that's, ooh. <laughs> See, I have a hard time saying anything specific at this point because everything is changing. Okay. Um, I do not use any one standard amp as of presently, as of uh-huh. 2021. Brandon Bailey does not use any specific model of amp. Okay. Um... I do still greatly enjoy my Sure Ultimate 57, mm-hmm. uh, Greg Human Signature. Right on. Um, other than that, that's my only standard piece of gear right now. Okay. All right. Um, something I've recently found effective for recording more so is the BBE 362 Sonic Maximizer. It's the old 80s unit, actually. Oh, okay. It's the rack version, basically, of what Jason okay. uses. Yeah. And um, it uh, just adds a nice little bit of boost and presence mm-hmm. around the mid-range, around 6K. You get a nice little jump that allows you to cut through the mix better. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty oh. much it. Uh, I do, I will say this. Um, as far as standard pieces if i'm doing a show in which uh i'm going to be playing amplified harmonica uh-huh. i will at the very least prefer to have a digital delay as well as an octave pedal okay pedal. now mm-hmm. as far as what that delay is and what the octave pedal is depends okay because there's so many different tones and textures that you can get depending upon situation Uh for example some of my favorites um for harmonica people will again give me a little little challenge on this and i do offer it but i actually really like the behringer pedals for harmonica okay um they work i've never tried a, a behringer pedal before actually. they they work very well actually the um, Behringer Octave uh-huh. uh huh as well as their clone of Boss's DD three mm-hmm. very good pedals for me personally um, now they are not true bypass mm-hmm. they are going to suck your tone okay <laughs> okay okay <laughs> but but um if you can work with that and you can find ways of making that sound work maybe to your benefit then they are very affordable and very 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 usable and by usable i mean i can dial those pedals in in ways that i can't on some of my boss pedals um the oc3 um in some ways does not track the bottom end of the harmonica as well. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. It's a matter of taste. Uh, and that's why, again, I'm not huge into uh, using any specific pieces of gear because mm -hmm. that can change depending upon the song. Right. That's for sure. That can, you know, obviously you want your standards. I do believe in using a consistent microphone uh -huh. um, because the sound that you're putting through your amp, your PA, your sound system, that does need to be consistent, right? Mm -hmm. um, therein, I prefer a clean microphone. Uh, that's something I learned from Adam. Um, I really enjoy the sound and the roundness and the grit of the bullet style microphones mm -hmm. and the crystal elements and the uh, ceramics, controlled reluctance, and all of those beautiful terms. <laughs> but it's like, um, so the harmonica is like a human voice for me. Very much. Right? And I think that the harmonica works best when recorded very similarly to the human voice. In that sense, taking in mind all the factors that you would with the human voice. Mm -hmm. What is the tonal characteristic that you want for this song? Well, some songs that may be a uh, dynamic, sure, SM58, standard vocal mic, right? Uh, some songs that may be a uh, road in T1A, a condenser microphone, right? Sure, sure. Uh, some songs that may be an AT2020, very basic condenser microphone. Yeah. Some songs that may be a uh, FET condenser. Some songs that may be a tube condenser. It really depends on, for me, what I'm needing in the sense of recording. Now, Mind you, I'm using the word recording a lot. Uh -huh. Live and recording are such two different beasts with the harmonica. I think that a lot of times as musicians, as harmonica musicians, we will take a live approach to our recording, uh -huh. um, which works and is fine, but may not give us everything we really want from the aspect of sound, from the aspect of sonics, from the aspect of being able to do everything we really want to do on the instrument sonically. Um, so in a live situation, what I'm going to be using is going to be very different from what I'm going to be using in yeah. a recording situation. Sure. Um, it is unlikely that you would see the same, uh, which is the standard, right? You yeah. know, what sure. I use at the gig normally is what I'm going to pack at the studio. And this used to be the case for myself as well, but in an age of 24-bit uh, resolution music being made, um, we kind of have to think a little bit more presently mm -hmm. about the equipment that we're using. I think some individuals who have this idea really, really well, let's take Howard. Yeah. Howard Levy. Mm -hmm. has been using the best condenser microphone for years for mm -hmm. harmonica. Um, Brendan Power. Right. With the Audix. Mm -hmm. Great microphone. Very, very clean. Yep. So, you know, characteristics that we as harmonica players traditionally consider mm, not great because we're not getting that extra bit of color and tone, right? Sure. Yeah. For me, that's where it's my philosophy about sound, right? What is your tone? Well, your tone is supposed to come from here, oh. not from the equipment that I'm using. Right. So I, I love James Cotton. Yeah. It didn't matter if he was playing through a vocal microphone or an amp, right. dirty or clean. Exactly. It didn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Even acoustically, mm -hmm. it didn't matter. So, yeah. Yeah. That's well, kind of my answer to the gear. Thing. <laughs> it's a good perspective on gear, and it's good for, I think, all of us to, to sort of give some credence and thought to because a lot of times, uh, especially as we're starting out, I was the same way. I, bu I mean, I bought all the pedals, like 
all the pedals, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. trying out your and, acquisition disorder. Yes, absolutely. It was like eBay. I was on it all the time, bidding on pedals and stuff, you know, and I, I, uh, I am sort of a pack rat in that regard. So I've still got them. Uh, but, uh, you know, and it's, it's a nice way to sort of figure out some different, some different things to do at your gig to wow some people, wow your crowd or just change it up a little bit. But mm-hmm. I think at its root, it's best to, uh, develop your sound and then just amplify it. That's, that's what the old guys did. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I love it. Fantastic. So you're uh, you're no longer in Memphis. Uh, you're living on the West Coast. Where? What city are you in at the moment? Sacramento. Oh, beautiful, very, very sunny nice. California. Yes. Good for you. And you're recently married. Congratulations. Yes. Me and my lovely wife Ashley. Yes. Yay. That's wonderful. Wonderful. You have li- living your best life out there. I know. Uh, I checked out, of course, I follow you on Instagram, so I see, you know, see your photos and stuff. Yeah, it looks like you're doing just wonderfully out there. Uh, but uh, being a doctor and being married, uh, how much time does that leave for your for your music? Um, as much as I can allow for it. <laughs> yeah. um, so obviously, especially situations considering COVID, mm-hmm. um, most of my focus has been... On recording um touring really? hasn't been really in the works for anyone over mm-hmm. the past year so been more so focused on um albums frankly really? and creating tracks and uh, doing more of this sonic wizardry mm-hmm. if you will, yeah in more of an official aspect um i haven't had an album released in some time mm-hmm. Um, 2011, are, is that right? That's you're right on the money. You did your research. Yeah. Well. Uh, <laughs> but yes. Um, so we are, uh, cooking. Yeah. Things well, I mean, you have a, you have a single out at the moment, 20 in the tank, super cool. Trip. Yes. Is that yeah. uh, a, a part of the, uh, the, a body of work that's, uh, that we're all going to be, uh, it is part of an upcoming body, uh, that as well as a few other songs that have recently released chocolate. Okay. So, so yeah. Daylight. Um, yes. And, and where can these, where can, uh, folks go to, uh, to purchase this music? Um, certainly the, uh, streaming channels, uh, Apple music, Spotify, mm-hmm. uh, YouTube music, anywhere where music is sold, you you'll be there. <laughs> Wonderful. That's the way that you're a smart man. That's the way to do it. That's the way to, so, uh, so, okay. Well, that's what's next on your horizon. Any plans to, uh, now that COVID is sort of releasing its grip a bit, uh, you, uh, have any plans to get back out and, and do some live performance? You know, it's definitely very, very, very high on my list and very tempting. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's just so much music to get out, mm-hmm. right? And for so many of us who've been shut away for the past year practicing and trying to get better at our craft. Um, so over the next year, we'll see uh, how the world is looking, first of all. Hopefully things are on an upswing in many ways, and definitely we're excited to get back out there. Right on. And the world is excited to, to hear new Brandon Bailey music. Brandon, it's been a, it's been a, a real uh, treat and an honor to, uh, to have My you. My pleasure. On Thank you so much for what you're doing for the community as well. Um, we need this seriously because this is something that really brings us as musicians together. We can have these conversations in an intimate setting about something that we're very, very passionate about. So right thank on. you my pleasure and i will continue let's do this again sometime absolutely can't wait great to to i we're gonna i'm gonna call you my friend now officially my friend absolutely wonderful to know you and to have listened to you over this last hour uh very enlightening and uh so grateful peace and love to you we'll see you next time take care absolutely